Hello everybody, you're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM with Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We play local unsigned and or independent music. And we catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Elk Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for the Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound listen again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. Uh, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. And if you would like to get in touch with me here at the studio, you can drop me a message on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So uh, this week, I have left preparing this week's show a little bit late. So um, we are going to have Twanglin' Jack Ford coming to the rescue once again. We're going to be doing a Twanglin' Jack Ford album review special. Um, so we're going to have a whole bunch of album reviews coming soon. But before we do that, we're going to head over to the Rye Light Zone for the latest instalment of Insomniac, which is a novella by myself, Dane Cobain. Week 5, Day 2. The insomnia was becoming unbearable. Kate was getting four hours a night at best, and she'd started to sweat almost constantly. It started at the nape of her neck and then rolled down her spine and towards her lower back, gathering momentum on its way. When she looked into the mirror, she was shocked by how dark her face looked, and her pupils had looked like pinpricks for almost as long as she could remember. When she looked at photos of herself, even just a couple of months earlier, she saw a different person. Now, with her tired eyes and her pale face, she looked more like a corpse than a living person, and no amount of concealer could help her. It was getting so bad that Kate went back to the doctor. He was a balding, middle-aged Asian with a friendly smile and a soft, soothing tone. Dr. Karnataka had something about him, some magical bedside manner, which always made Kate feel a little selfer. He had a lot of sympathy, and that helped. Still struggling? he asked. Kate nodded. I've been tracking my sleep, she said. You want to see the reports? It can't hurt, Dr. Karnataka said, but make sure you don't obsess about it. If you worry about your sleep too much, it becomes counterproductive. Obsessive, Kate said. Me? I get your point, the doctor replied. But honestly, Kate, I see no real reason for your insomnia. Is it related to my OCD? Could be, the doctor said evasively. But who knows? The human brain is a mysterious thing. We still don't fully understand it. But you can help me sleep, Kate said, right? I can try, the doctor said. He dashed out a couple of lines on a prescription form, signed on the dotted line and handed it over to her. Here, take this. What is it? It's diphenhydramine, Dr. Karnataka explained, an antihistamine. You mean like for hay fever? Exactly, the doctor said, but it'll help you sleep as well. Have you got anything more powerful? I have, Karnataka replied, but I'd like to hold that in reserve for now. Rest assured, if the diphenhydramine doesn't work, we'll start looking into alternatives. But Kate couldn't rest assured. She hadn't rested assured since the day she'd been late to work and the month-long nightmare had begun. She hoped that it was almost over. Week 6, Day 3. For her first two nights on the drug, Kate slept surprisingly well. Oh sure, the nights were still dark and full of terrors, but she fell asleep in 30 minutes or so instead of her customary three to four hours. Her brain told her that it was the placebo effect. Her body said otherwise. But the third night was so-so, and on the fourth night she was back to her old ways, just in time for the weekend. At least Mr Murray wouldn't be watching her like a hawk while she tried to keep her eyes open. And then the side effects kicked in, starting with a dry mouth and throat which progressed into what felt like a full-on flu. She felt dizzy, sleepy, knocked sideways by life and too strung out to tell who she was, where she was or what time it was. Sunday, she thought. Nah, to hell with it. She got up to pour herself a glass of water then swayed slightly as she walked back towards her bedroom and dropped it on the floor. The glass shattered and flew across the room or embedded itself in the side of her foot and the water made the blood take on a surreal oily sheen. She reached down to her foot and touched it then held her fingers up in front of her face. The sight of it made her feel faint and her vision blurred, and she smeared the blood absentmindedly across the lids of her eyes. Kate limped through to the bathroom, leaving a trail of bloody footprints in her wake. She turned the shower on, climbed gingerly out of her clothes and stepped under the water. She gritted her teeth and told herself not to cry as she washed her wounds and tried to pick the glass out. Week 6, Day 6 Kate's foot hurt, but it didn't hurt enough to stop her from working. Her colleagues shot concerned glances towards her, but she tried to diffuse them by pretending she hadn't noticed. She was used to not noticing her colleagues. It's funny, Kate thought. She used to give a shit about her job, and then her poor health had forced her to put herself first, and as soon as she did that, she started to underperform when compared to the idiot she shared her tiny cubicle with. 
She had a couple of deadlines looming, and Mr. Murray was watching her like a hawk, probably hoping that she'd fail again so he could show her the door without bringing on a tribunal. She didn't want to give him the satisfaction. But she also felt like, like she'd died and been reborn with a stomach full of acid, and her frequent trips to the toilet were without success, although they did give her a chance to close her eyes for a time. It felt like there was something inside her that wanted to get out, but it didn't matter what she did, it just wasn't coming. Kate went back to her desk, clutching her stomach and groaning quietly to herself. She hoped nobody noticed, but they did, of course. Kate, Mr. Murray boomed, strolling through the office towards her like an infantryman on the battlefield. You look terrible. Thanks, she said, smiling weakly while her heart skimmed and sank like a stone into the ocean. I'm serious, he said. Big night last night? Kate shook her head. I don't drink, she replied. Well, not anymore. Are you sure about that? Murray scrutinised her face, and she took an involuntary step backwards. Her forehead was still healing, her eyes were dark and sunken, and her self-esteem was so low that just one pair of eyes on her was too many. Kate's eyes were dry. Her stomach churned like a bad hangover, and for a second or two, she thought perhaps the boss was right. Perhaps she was hungover. Perhaps she'd somehow drank herself into oblivion between the last thing she remembered, lying wide awake in bed and checking her phone every four minutes, and the sweet, sweet sleep of unconsciousness. She opened her mouth to say something to Mr. Murray, then snapped it shut again. She swallowed. Then she covered her mouth with her hand and made a break for the bathroom. Week 7, Day 4 Kate was in a bad place. She'd stopped caring about the lack of sleep. She felt the effects constantly and she woke every day feeling slightly worse than she'd felt the night before as she waited in vain for sleep to come. By the seventh week, she was starting to feel paranoid. She felt the CCTV cameras looking down at her when she walked into the supermarket and she felt as though total strangers were staring as she strolled down the street. She wore the dark glasses everywhere now, so much so that she'd been taken for blind a couple of times and offered a seat on the underground. Her mother told her she was being paranoid, but her mother had always been dismissive when she talked about her poor health and her anxiety and depression. She didn't mean any harm by it. She'd just been as healthy as a breeding bull for her entire life and found it hard to understand why anyone else should be different. That just made Kate withdraw even further. By week seven, she was dodging her mother's calls and failing to honour any social engagements because she didn't want people to ask her that awful question. What happened? Kate knew she looked like something had happened, but as far as she could tell, there was nothing. Still, that didn't stop her from worrying about it. Her anxiety told her she was dying. Her paranoia told her everyone was watching while she did so. It also told her that doctors were evil swine who were being paid by pharmaceutical companies to pump their patients full of drugs that they didn't need. She didn't want to visit the hospital if she could help it, and even the thought of kind-hearted Dr. Karnataka filled her with a subtle dread. She hadn't been to work all week. She had a feeling that Mr. Murray was out to get her. Week 8, Day 2 In the end, Kate relented. Dr. Karnataka had a full schedule, but he agreed to squeeze in an appointment at the end of the day. He was visibly shocked to see her, and Kate took it badly. She tried to cover her face as best as she could, but Karnataka was simply staggered by her eyes and their hollow, hunted, haunted look. You don't look so good, he said, beckoning her into his office from the waiting area. You'd better come in. He held the door open and Kate slouched gratefully into the room. It smelled of cleaning products, so stubbornly antiseptic that she wondered if her nostrils would ever feel neutral again. She followed him inside and sat in the chair. I'm still not sleeping, she said. Karnataka gave her a cursory glance over and gestured for her to roll up her sleeve. He started to take her blood pressure while she was talking. Maybe an hour or two at best. Sometimes when it's late at night, I start to see things, and I can't shake the feeling that there's someone out there, someone watching me. Dr. Karnataka paused as the device constricted itself around her arm. He looked at her and said, Watching you? I know, Kate said. It sounds crazy. I can't explain it, Doc. I feel like a little kid with a monster complex. It's like there's something beneath my bed. Maybe there is. Maybe that's why I can't sleep. Maybe, the doctor said. He sighed. How did you get on with the diphenhydramine? Kate shrugged. It worked for a while, she said, a couple of nights at least, but now it's just as bad as ever. Is there anything else you can give me? Tamazepam, Karnataka said. Tamaza what? Tamazepam, Karnataka repeated. It's stronger. It should knock you out and help you to stay out. A word of warning, though. I don't want you to stay on it for too long. It's a short-term fix only, okay? I'll try anything. Good, the doctor said. He filled out a prescription for two weeks' worth of the medication. I want to see you back in here before you run out, okay? Week 10, day 1. All in all, the Tamazepam worked like a charm. There were side effects, perhaps, but there were side effects to everything. Besides, she'd slept soundly for three nights in a row and managed to get up to a good 8 out of 10 at work, although Mr Murray was still keeping a close eye on her. His bent nose and bushy eyebrows even cropped up in a dream, the first dream she could remember having since the troubles began. But then everything started to come unravelled. 
The paranoia had been bad enough, but it was the phobias that tore her apart. She couldn't leave the house. There were birds out there, germs, sweaty feet in sweaty socks and sweaty shoes with their toes wiggling like worms on the end of a fishing line, bank robbers, thieves, beggars. There were drunk drivers, child molesters, rapists, and worst of all, the bloody bees. The bees were orbiting her house and bashing themselves against the windows. They were watching her when she undressed for the shower and listening whenever she picked the phone up. Part of her mind told her she was being irrational, but another part told her that it was better to be safe than sorry. Over the last couple of days, she'd been able to restore a little order to her life, and she'd been comforted by the warm embrace of a steady routine. Now that she'd found it, she was unwilling to give it up, which is why anything out of the ordinary posed a threat, no matter how minor. She'd read online that the difference between a fear and a phobia is that a phobia is ungrounded. If she had to guess, she would have said that she was under attack by both of them. They came in waves, first one and then the other, and Kate was tired of fighting. So she retreated instead, surrendering to the paranoia in the hope of declaring a ceasefire, but her body was having none of it. It fought back like a corned wildcat, pushing her heartbeat up and up until she felt like it was ready to burst from her chest. She started working from home and spent most of her time in bed. Week 11, Day 4 Mr Murray hand-delivered the letter so that he could personally watch her face fall. She knew what it was without even having to open it. This is my written warning, she said, right? Mr Murray smiled at her and nodded. And you know what comes next? A promotion? Murray scowled at her. The day you get a promotion is the day the devil comes up from hell and dances the tango on national television, he said. This is your final warning, Kate. One more slip and you're out of here. I know, she said. Mr Murray, I'm doing my best. Yeah? For a moment he looked as though he was about to say something supportive. Then he came out with, Well, your best isn't good enough. Kate frowned and looked down at her feet, avoiding eye contact with the man. They made no secret of their dislike for each other, and the rumour mill was on fire with all sorts of accusations. Not that either of them paid any attention. Do you mind me asking what I did? It's all in the letter, Mr Murray replied. Perhaps you should go and read it. Murray smiled sarcastically at her and strode off towards the design studio, leaving her shaking silently at her desk and trying to make sense of it all. When the coast was clear, she hid herself away in the bathroom and slid the letter out of the envelope. It had the company's logo on a letterhead and was signed by both Mr Murray and Rita Hawking. It wasn't good news, although it didn't actually explain what the warning was for. She didn't really care. Later that afternoon, when nobody was paying much attention, she slipped into one of the meeting rooms, hung a busy sign on the door handle and took a power nap. For once, she fell asleep almost immediately. Week 12, Day 2 Kate was constipated. Sure, she didn't exactly think she was unicorn dust, but her bowels had never given her much pause for thought. That always just worked, which was why when they stopped working, she started to worry. Her brain was telling her stories about the big C and, as with most things, once the thought was established, she couldn't get rid of it. So she sat on the toilet, straining and pushing herself into the seat. She crossed her legs and applied some pressure, grabbed hold of her thighs and pulled her legs, but her body literally didn't give a shit. Just a panic attack that hit her with a right hook and made her roll over until her knees were on the floor and her head was in the bowl. She retched but didn't vomit, climbed back onto the seat and then touched up her makeup while on the throne. She balanced a compact mirror on the toilet roll holder and grimaced as she tried to make herself look presentable. It was an uphill challenge, but she'd had a lot of practice over the last couple of weeks, and she was getting the hang of using the cubicle as a dressing room. It was no good. She couldn't go. She wiped herself anyway and then pulled her clothes back up, packed her makeup away and flushed the toilet. As she was about to leave, a colleague came in, so she sat back down and waited it out. When the room was exclusively hers again, she exited the stall and walked over to the sink. She washed her hands six times, pulled a toothbrush from her bag, squeezed out a little paste and freshened her breath. Brush, floss, brush, repeat. Week 13, day 6. At the weekend, Kate felt well enough to leave the house. She had a catch-up scheduled with her mother and sister. After missing two on the trot, she didn't want to miss another. So she dressed herself up in her favourite clothes, a tight top and skinny jeans that hung from a skeletal frame like baggy hand-me-downs. They met at the cafe at the local museum. She'd been hoping that she'd pass for normal, but no such luck. You look awful, girl, her sister said. Have you been eating? Yeah, Kate replied, like a horse. But the weight keeps dropping off. It's like there's a hole in my stomach. Hmm, my mother said. Leave your sister alone, Lauren. I'm sure she's doing her best. Thanks, Kate murmured. If only my best was good enough. They were only at the museum for a cuppa at the coffee shop, but Kate's mother insisted on forcing three slices of carrot cake down her daughter's gullet. Kate liked carrot cake, so she didn't complain. And as her mother had always said, it was made from vegetables, and so it was healthy. How's work? her mother asked. Kate was in the middle of a mouthful, so she chewed and swallowed and then took a sip of coffee to clear the crumbs before she replied. It's okay, she said, eventually. Okay, yeah? 
Lauren said. She cocked an eyebrow at her younger sister. Well, it could be going better, Kate admitted, but whatever, I don't think I'll be there for much longer. Why is that? Kate laughed bitterly and shook her head. Just call it a hunch, she said. Week 14, day 5. It had been a good week. The Tamazepam was still working its magic and Kate had been getting a good five hours a night. She felt sluggish for a while in the morning, but it was nothing that a little coffee couldn't cure. And then she made a mistake. It started out like a normal Friday. Kate was half an hour early to the office and spent the time catching up with some paperwork. It had seemed like a good idea at the time, especially because it was long overdue, but it was also stressful. Mr Murray tasked her with handing in a report by the end of the day. Then a client called to complain about an error she'd made in her last set of spreadsheets, which had cost them £700 to correct. Kate begged the client not to tell anyone, and perhaps surprisingly, the client agreed. But even though she'd tried to keep her voice down, a couple of her colleagues overheard her. She hoped they'd keep it to themselves. As it turned out, the colleagues weren't the problem. Mr Murray never had a chance to find out because by the time that the day was over, she'd already been kicked out of the building. The stress just got to be too much for her. She was tired, and for once it had nothing to do with a lack of sleep. She was tired of life and its monotony, tired of having to pretend to give a sh**, and she was tired of the constant panic attacks. So when Murray crept up behind her again and laid a hand on her shoulder, she reacted on instinct. She just did what came naturally. She turned around and punched him square in the jaw. Then she picked up a handbag, slung it over her shoulder and walked out of the door. Week 15, day 2. Kate wasn't sleeping well. No surprise there, then. Since walking out of the office on the previous Friday, she'd left her phone turned off and had stayed away from social networking sites. She had a feeling that her address was on file somewhere, so she also closed the curtains and locked herself away in her bedroom. Her grandmother, Nana Knight, was keeping her company. She'd been dead for 20 years, but Kate still heard her voice when she was stressed or depressed. The old crone had a habit of expressing her opinions from beyond the grave in the same shaky voice that she'd used to make pronouncements on Kate's school friends or the dresses she'd pick out at the weekend. Useless, the old woman kept saying. You're bloody useless, girl. No wonder you can't hold a job down. You can't even hold yourself together. I know, Nana, Kate said. I'm trying, okay? I'm trying. Well, try harder, girl. Kate was lying in bed with her eyes closed, and when she opened them up, she almost expected the old woman to be sitting there beside her, rocking backwards and forwards on her mahogany chair and using her lap as a wool basket as she clicked needles together with a cigarette in her mouth. But there was no one there. She was all alone in her pokey bedroom. No job, no lover and she couldn't sleep. That was the latest instalment of Insomniac by myself, Dane Cobain, for this week's entry into the Rylight Zone. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. And this is Joe Martin with Dreamlike State. I'm here, I'm here like a light in the sand I'm dry and Maybe I should be writing something To mean something to somebody, to me, but the words are like drip, drip, and somehow they don't want to fit, fit, there's a shift and the changes, I'm into different stages, oh, I'm just so here reflecting on my life. Taking step by step And sometimes I'm not walking Or talking Lying on the carpet in a dreamlike state Lying on the carpet in a dreamlike state I'm just sad here Reflecting my life, taking step by step. But sometimes I'm not even walking or talking. Lying on the carpet in a dreamlike state. Shedding clothes There is only darkness here I played my hand 
A Crooked Mile by Steve Winch in The Inception. Before that, we had Dreamlike State by Joe Martin. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Kamein. And it's time for us to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for a few album reviews for this week's Twangling Jack album review special. Blood, Sweat and Tears Greatest Hits. An LP I bought at the vintage sale in the Front Room Cafe in Castle Street. I have always been a sucker for a horn section. Dexy's Midnight Runners, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Dukes, Earth, Wind and Fire, The Stax Records and Memphis Horns, Pink Floyd's Atom Heart Mother, or Zappa's Stairway to Heaven. But I always thought Blood, Sweat and Tears were a bit rock music for people who don't like rock music. A bit mum and dadsy. I mostly did not like their singer, David Clayton Thomas a man regarded as being the jewel in their crown. Yet to me he seemed to be a bit light entertainment or even cabaret. It is why I prefer the early works of the band Chicago, which featured smoother voices and harmonies. I also preferred the early works of Blood, Sweat and Tears. It was originally formed by Al Cooper, who was a session guitarist who had played with Bob Dylan. Though he mainly played guitar, he is most famous for the organ on Like a Rolling Stone. Al Cooper sang on the first Blood, Sweat and Tears album, and I probably prefer the two songs on this album that he wrote and sang on. They combine jazz, soul, rock and classical, so there is some fine keyboard and guitar work going on, but it is the horns that make it. They punctuate with stabbing riffs, and they add moody backing textures, they often provide the hooks, the bits that stay in your head. You cannot think of a song like You Make Me So Very Happy without remembering the way the horns rise into the bridge. This album also has the great Blood, Sweat and Tears song Spinning Wheel, along with Billie Holiday's God Bless the Child and an uplifting gospelish version of Laura Nairo's And When We Die. Blood, Sweat and Tears the greatest hits. The Breeders Last Splash I had not heard anything by The Breeders when I bought their third album for a quid in the library cell, but I knew The Breeders were fronted by Kim Deal from Pixies. There was something totally compelling about that album. The Breeders mixed standard distorted guitars and catchy pop songs with all kinds of odd unexpected elements. The singing is often quite soft and intimate with very melodic and puzzling lyrics. This is often performed over very distorted guitars. They are not just an indie post-punk alt-rock band in the same way that Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band 
were not just a blues band. Having been intrigued by the third album, I listened to a CD of the first two albums, and then I found this, the second album, in a charity shop. The Breeders made their first album while Pixies were on a break, but this album was made after Pixies had split. The guitarist from the first Breeders album was not available, so Kim Deal got her twin sister Kelly to learn guitar and join the band. As teenagers, Kim and Kelly had performed together as a country duo. Kim sings very sweetly, but when she sings with her sister, you get that perfect sibling voice matching. The songs are simple and catchy, but the album is chaotic in a pleasing way. In that way of all those records that are made much better by odd samples or sounds. Going back to Pink Floyd's cash registers, or even the snatch of a radio production of King Lear that jumps out of I Am The Walrus. I always think of that out of place odd clown Carl Horn type honk that totally makes the Cure single close to me so irresistible. This album's main attraction is the hit single Cannonball, which sums up the whole ethos of the breeders. It starts with the bass player making a mistake and then correcting herself. A lot of the lyrics are indecipherable, some sung through a distorting microphone. The words you can make out are enigmatic. The musical hook is a guitar line that sounds like a mistake and the track keeps abruptly stopping in what seems to be an almost random fashion. I watched a YouTube documentary that detailed the almost obsessive way that Kim Deal peppered the album with carefully contrived events, most of which sound quite random and many of which sound like mistakes. There are several hooky poppy numbers like the song Divine Hammer, but there are moments of sheer oddness and noise. Much of the noise is caused by the purposeful mistreatment of electric guitars, making the breeders sound a bit like Sonic Youth meets Banana Rama. Kim Deal wrote and sang one of Pixie's finest songs, Gigantic, but she was mostly kept in her place as just the bass player. However, the breeders outsold Pixies. Brian Adams, The Best of Me, a compilation CD I got from a charity shop. Brian Adams appeared at a time when my mind had been poisoned by music biz types and the new musical express. I could see no use for him, like going back to spam when we had become accustomed to steak. He was a utilitarian rock star, no frills, no image, he fitted no category. He just had these stadium-friendly pop rock songs like Summer of 69 and Run To You. It was like Springsteen had discovered how to write simple pop songs when he had the energy of just starting out, rather than waiting till his fifth album. Brian Adams rapidly became massive, but he also became part of the background noise to my life. I am sure being at a Brian Adams gig would have been immense fist-pumping lighters in the air fun. It was not really heavy rock, it was not punk, but to me it sounded a bit like Bon Jovi meets Green Day. In a strange way it was not cool to like Brian Adams, but neither was it cool to diss him. But then there was that Robin Hood theme, everything I do, I do it for you, and the nation never needed to hear Brian Adams ever again. But then I was charmed by, of all things, a duet with a Spice Girl. Luckily it was the one that can sing. Baby When You're Gone gave me a bit of a Mel C crush. I think I read somewhere that another female singer did the duet in the States, so I checked it was Mel C before buying this disc even though I only paid a pound for it. I felt it would have been disloyal to buy it had she not been on it. In my world, Mel C is a national treasure, just as I imagine Brian Adams is in Canada. Brian Adams, the best of me. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. We have been having some album reviews from Twanglin Jack Ford for our album review special. Uh, and this is Superlord with Desert Ruins.
That was Desert Ruins by Superlord. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to head back over to the Ilk Shed to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for some more album reviews for this week's Twanglin' Jack Ford album review special. Little Mix. Glory days. This is a CD I bought from the Salvation Army charity shop in Aylesbury for a pound. I knew that this particular album by Little Mix would be my recommendation and I knew one day I would find it in a charity shop, such is fashion. I have only ever watched two episodes of X Factor, and that was only to see a local girl reach the final. I don't remember the songs they sang, but I do remember the awful outfits they made them wear. However, I liked that they seemed to be charmingly untainted by showbiz. Four girls next door in different shades and shapes. Two northerners, one Londoner, and one from High Wycombe. About the time this album came out, I was listening to a lot of Radio 2, mostly Chris Evans. Radio 2 would occasionally play something a bit Radio 1, a bit of Beyonce or Rihanna. I kept hearing shout out to my ex from this album, and it really cut through the typical Radio 2 tracks like a chainsaw. The percussion is everything I like, loud and tribal. The vocals are shouty, exuberant and fun. More spice up your life than two becomes one. Then there is another song that sounded like an updated classic from the era of girl groups and the wall of sound. I was not listening hard enough to notice the controversial lyric A, B, C, D, E, F, U. But if I had noticed, I would have probably admired it even more. It has that same retro familiar feel as Perfect by Ed Sheeran, but it is much more fun. This is followed by a song that seems to owe a lot to the production of Amy Winehouse, with a deep popping sax pushing the beat. The album seems to peak with a full-on knock your socks off gigantic festival of EDM trickery. Big dance beats, big synth sounds and oversung auto-tuned vocals. But having taken things as far as they could go, the last few numbers are a bit more the kind of girl band filler songs you might expect. Though some have the kind of big multi-layered choruses with multiple harmonies that I am a bit of a sucker for. Generally the singing is good, there is obviously some electronic enhancement, but I have seen impressive clips of them singing a cappella. The vocal arrangements and harmonies are clever and interesting. The four girls next door eventually became indistinguishable under layers of fake tan, looking cold in skimpy leotards, at miserable outdoor television appearances. They gave good interviews and they were fun, they did not seem to be taking it too seriously, but one of them struggled to keep up with the corporate body image and was brought down by malicious trolls. She left to go solo and the others just seemed to have grown up, had babies and become civilians. But this album is actually much better than it needed to be. Glory Days, Little Mix. Massive Attack, Blue Lines. This album came out in 1991 and gave birth to Trip Hop. The theme to The Sopranos is not on this album. The theme to The Sopranos is not even by Massive Attack, though it sounds like it is. The big Massive Attack hit, Unfinished Sympathy, featuring Shara Nelson, is on this album. Unfinished Sympathy was a cultural phenomenon. Not only was the song one of the best examples of the dance music that came out at the start of the 90s, but the video was a work of art in its own right and must have greatly added to the amount of attention the track gained. I also have a Massive Attack compilation CD, and the two standout tracks are Unfinished Sympathy and the later song Teardrop. The styles are very different. I have always seen this album in charity shops and discount bins, but I never bought it because I had the compilation album. This album was not really what I was expecting. I was probably expecting something a bit Prodigy meets Portishead. But this album has that same up-tempo driving bass and heavy sampled drums as had the Alabama 3 Sopranos theme. There is some rapping and scratching and even some heavy dub guitar. But the surprise is that there are more real songs. Soul songs with simple chord progressions. 
Songs in a style similar to Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing. These songs are also sung by Shara Nelson, along with reggae star Horace Andy, and with a bit of help from friends like Nana Cherry. Listening to the album as a whole gives a much better context to Unfinished Sympathy than any compilation could. And you can look at the pictures of the band when they were young, and you can speculate which one grew up to be Banksy. Massive Attack. Blue Lines. MC5, kick out the jams. Brothers and sisters, the time has come for each and every one of you to decide whether you are going to be the problem or whether you are going to be the solution. So went the famous speech that starts this album. Kick out the jams by the MC5 is one of those essential energetic blasts of guitar-driven frenzy that were the bedrock for all the great guitar music from the 70s onwards. Like the Who Live at Leeds and the Stones Get Your Yah-Yahs Out, it is a document of an experienced band not playing it safe. They may claim not to be jamming, but it is controlled chaos. It goes right to the edge and then threatens to leap into the void. I'm not sure when I first heard the MC5. They are always in documentaries about protest music. There is film of the MC5 at a political rally. They also appear in documentaries tracing the origins of punk music. You can see how the MC5 were influenced by rock and roll, blues and soul, particularly James Brown. But they themselves influenced future bands in the same way that the Velvet Underground and the Stooges did. But there are also riffs and blistering lead guitar solos, like Lizzie or Motorhead. The song Kick Out The Jams has become a standard covered by other bands. They were called MC5 because they came from the Motor City, Detroit. Kick Out The Jams was their first and most successful album. There is headbanging and plenty of punk attitude and even a bit of space rock with the final track giving a co-credit to Sun Ra. It was recorded in 1968, a year famous for unrest. They play a 12-bar called Motor City is Burning, which is probably the heaviest, dirtiest and most aggressive blues I think I have ever encountered. It captures 1968 better than the Stone Street Fighting Man. There are riffs that are intense, monstrous, distorted versions of Wild Thing, or I Can See For Miles. There is an excellent cleaned up clip of them on YouTube, but it has to be played painfully loud for it to make any sense. Kick out the jams, the MC5. Big thank you to Twanglin Jack Ford for this week's album reviews for our Twanglin Jack album review special. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and this is Favourite Shoes by Will Riding. Just want to be in me favourite shoes The jumbled up world's not for me I trip and I stumble, yes I'm easily bruised To just let me be in me favourite shoes I wake up in the morning I count up to ten I get myself dressed And count down again Squaring off circles And straightening lines Helps me to get through the day I just want to be In me favourite shoes A jumbled up world's not for me Trip and I stumble, yes, I'm easily bruised. So just let me be in me favourite shoes. I don't step on cracks, and no, I don't eat red food in me colourful world of black and white rules. Where the safety in numbers and in regular times When you see through these eyes I just want to be in me favourite shoes A jumbled up world's not for me I trip and I stumble, yes I'm easily bruised 
trip and I stumble Yes, I'm easily bruised So just let me be in my favourite shoes Step, and there's a smile upon my face Cause inside my head There's a magical space Where the bullies can't reach me And jump on my toes The words they use can't reach my ears I just want to be In me favourite shoes the Jumbled up world's not for me and I stumble, yes, I'm easily bruised So just let me be in me favourite shoes Yeah, just let me be in me favourite shoes at the expense of someone else Let's just be happy Cause often we can see When we're being the man And when we'll be the pigs And when we're at it With all the worries gone We won't tell whose meat we're feasting on This is by natural law, just like the cycle By Carnot for all the joy and life we clutch We're stealing twice as much And even leaving meat alone You'll still consume some to the bone Yes, in the form of rubbish roasts And vegan Facebook posts Perhaps as we discuss this crack The pigs have got it figured out And offer us their juicy ribs As seemingly as sacrificial wonder pigs Let's just be happy Cause often we can see When we're being the man And when we'll be the pigs And when you want it You'll be too busy to Notice what the others did for the bacon song by the Gault, not very vegan and before that we have our favorite shoes by will riding you're listening to the art show on 106.6 fm wickham sound i'm your host Dave Bain. this is the point in the show at which we would normally head over to the oak shed to catch up with twangling jack ford for uh, his weekly album review but obviously it's been our album review special today so we've had plenty of those so instead it is time for me to remind you guys you can find us on facebook if you search about the art show on wickham sound you should be able to find us you can reach out to 
contact me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share, local arts, news, etc. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us uh, on iTunes, Spotify, etc., wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a short review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. And we are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, and we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune. This is Maz Manzini with Always Time. I'll catch you next week. Get yourself outside